Welcome to the second video in Video, mo video Module 2. Uh, video Module 2 is our initial job shop models, and in the second video, we will use the model that we developed in Video 1 and go through a verification exercise and talk a little bit about experimentation and do uh, a fairly simplistic experiment. So verification, uh, remember, is part of verification and validation, two separate but related processes associated with model correctness. And the verification half is ensuring the model does what you expect it does, or does as you've designed it to do. And so if you look back at our model, here's the model that we um, developed. Remember, it is a four-station job shop. We have three different part types. And if we look at what we specified here, we have an arrival process. And our arrival process uh, has an in-arrival time distribution and a part mix. And so we said that we want to generate parts randomly where all parts are equally likely. We have sequences for each part, and so if we look at our, uh, our sequence table that we developed, uh, we can see that part one goes from S1 to two to three to four, uh, part two goes from three to four to one to two, and part three goes from two to four. So we have that arrival process, we have the routing process, and then we have the service time processes uh, at each one of the stations. So the service time, it depends on the station and the uh, part type, and it's specified here uh, in excuse me, in the sequence. And so when we talk about correctness, what we want to do is make sure that those things are happening, make sure that we've implemented those things correctly. And so the first way that we do that is something called face verification, where we basically just watch the model. And so we do this as we go. So let me just change the speed a little bit. And we, uh, as we built the model, we did quite a bit of this, as you recall, uh, is we just want to watch it and make sure that we don't see anything strange. So what we expect to see as, we, as the model runs is we expect to see the parts moving in the sequence that are defined. We can slow the entities down, which we did in the previous model, and watch that. We also expect to see, you know, uh, statistically speaking, an equal number of uh, red parts, green parts, and blue parts. And so we can watch uh, until, you know, until we're satisfied that, uh, uh, that we don't see anything strange. The second basic method that we're going to use for verification switch back to my PowerPoint here, involves using a basic queuing model. Now, before we talk about that at all, let me point out that queuing is not a prerequisite for this class. It can be helpful if you've had it because it's a very nice method for doing verification, but we're not going to do any significant queuing work in this class, and the very, very small amount that we will do is easily picked up uh, as we go. So if you haven't had queuing, uh, don't worry at all. Um, I would recommend that you just have a quick look at the Chapter 2 in the uh, Simio and Simulation textbook. But again, we're not going to have assignments involving queuing or anything. Okay, so for our queuing model, uh, what we want to do is use a basic queuing network model to verify our baseline model. A quick note, uh, for those of you who've had queuing, uh, the utilizations that we compute will be exact, uh, but the L's and W's, in other words, the expected or average number in system and time in system will not be exact because our model doesn't meet the general uh, assumptions associated with Jackson network models. So again, if you've had no queuing, doesn't matter. That, uh, just ignore that. If you have had queuing, just be aware that the overall uh, utilizations that we get are exact, but the estimates that we have of the L's and W's are not. For a simple model like this, uh, the, I typically use Excel to develop my queuing model. And so you can see this here, uh, my model here. And you can see that I have my arrivals, so these are my external arrivals, and so I have the arrive, inner arrival time of 10 minutes, and then I can calculate the rate by just inverting uh, that value. Note also that I typically use the time, inner arrival time and service time in, in units of minutes, and the rates in units of hours. That's just by convention. You don't have to do that. That's typically what I do. And so you'll see that instead of just inverting the value, I also have to multiply it by 60 so that I can get that uh, get the rate in units of hours. So once I know that initial arrival rate, I then have my three parts. I can specify my mix, and then I can use the ratio to compute the ratio uh, of this particular part. So as I said when we talked about using the uh, random row function from, from Simio, it takes the individual value, in this case one, and divides it by the sum, and that's exactly what I'm doing here on the ratio. And so that I can compute the rate that I would expect to see parts of each type by simply multiplying uh, those values together. So the overall rate to the system times that ratio. So nothing uh, magical here. I'm just trying to figure out what the expected rate of arrivals that we see. 
I then replicated the mean processing time uh, table for uh, for our uh, parts, and so this I just these are the exact same numbers that we saw in the uh, PowerPoint. And then I can use these values to compute the proportion of utilization of each station uh, that's going to be re um, uh, th that's going to be used by the respective parts. So, for example, when I look at S1 here, and if I multiply these values together, so I'm saying if the value is, is greater than zero, then I can simply take the uh, rate, remember it's lambda divided by uh, C mu, and so I'm just saying, okay, well, 40% of the utilization is going to be consumed by P1 on S1, given this arrival rate and given this, th this ratio. And then I can sum those values uh, across all parts, and so 40% of S1 is P1, and 33% uh, of S1 is uh, P2. P3 doesn't go to S1, and so it has zero contribution to the overall uh, utilization. And so, as I said, these numbers will be exact because they're not dependent on most of the queuing, the assumptions associated with our, with our queuing network. The number and system and time and system, these are number and station and time and station, not system. Uh, I use the standard queuing formulas for this because we have uh, a single server queuing systems, but these will not be exact. But even though they're not exact, they're still useful because it gives me some general idea of what to expect. So if you think about the average number in system and time in system, uh, our expectation from our queuing model is 30.75 um, uh, for the number in system and uh, 307.5 minutes for the average time in system. Again, those aren't exact, but it gives me a, it gives me a ballpark that I, uh, that I want to look for. And again, these should be exact. So I should be able to uh, use my experiment uh, to match these numbers exactly. Well, exactly in the statistical sense. Uh, so I will make this uh, spreadsheet available to you. Uh, if you're familiar with queuing, then this should be pretty straightforward to do. Uh, if not, again, no big deal. Uh, so I will make this uh, available. So in order to evaluate these, what I need to do is I need to, in my, in my simulation model, identify these values. These are the ones of interest, the utilizations, the number in system, and time in system. And so we saw that in our, if we go back to our model, in our results. So if I go to my results tab, so I had my run of a thousand hours. If I go to my, my results, you can see the values of interest to us here are our utilizations, 74.4, uh, 94.9, uh, 87.7, and 92.5, uh, all kind of within the realm of uh, what I expect. The number in system is 37 on average and the flow time is 6.16. Uh, uh, this is in hours, and in the spreadsheet I, I had that in minutes. But again, this is based on a single replication. We haven't had a warm-up period, so we're still likely including the transient period. And so we, un we recognize, or hopefully we recognize, that we can't draw any conclusions from a single replication of the model. If I want to do any statistically valid comparison, I have to replicate the model, consider things like runtime, uh, and the transient period and warm-up time uh, and things like that. And so that's what we're going to do next with a Simio experiment. So back to our model. And to create my experiment, I'm going to go to Project Home and then click on New Experiment. And you can see we've created an experiment named Experiment 1. And uh, the basic structure of the experiment uh, is we're specifying the number of replications that we'd like to run. These are independent, statistically independent replications. We can specify a warm-up period and then some of the uh, confidence levels and percentiles and so on that um, uh, we'll talk about a little bit later. So the things that I need to add, uh, I want to add experimental responses for our performance metrics of interest. And those were, again, utilization, number and system, and time and system. So let's add those. I'm going to go to my first response, and I'm going to call this S1 util or S1 utilization. And then the expression that I want, we'll use the expression builder here, here, S1 capacity scheduled utilization. There we go. So that's S1 util. We'll just copy this to the clipboard because our other three are going to be similar. Uh, so we'll create our second response is S2 util. So here's where we'll just paste in from the clipboard and then just go change the one to a two. It's our S2 util. We'll add the third one. S3 util, and as you would expect, I will just paste this in, and this time change the 1 to a 3. 
and then I will add the fourth response, paste it in, and change the value from one to four. And so that's what we our uh, uh, scheduled utilizations are. And so what I'm going to do here is just do a quick run of my model. I haven't done anything about runtime or any of that yet, uh, but I just want to uh, do some of this as we go verification. And so I have some general expectation of what I see, what I expect these values to be. And so I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time. I'm just going to look and say, you know, if I get something like 10% here or zero here or something, I know I have a problem. These are well within the realm of, of what I expect. So I'm going to stop that uh, and then add our second two um, uh, experimental responses. So the first one is uh, L, the number of entities, average number of entities in the system. And recall that we created a user statistic for this because we have four different or three different entity types. So we need uh, NIS average. So NIS was our uh, state statistic, and we just need that average value. Uh, and then finally, I need the average time in system. And so we will go and call this W. And because, again, I have the way Simeo tracks these values is I can get the time and system by each individual part type, but that's not what I'm after. I'm after the overall. So uh, as you recall, I hope, uh, the sync automatically tracked those values. Since all of the entities go through the same sync, I can just use sync input buffer, input buffer, buffer, if I can spell. Um, What do we have here? Contents. Uh, okay, let's try this more. Sync one. Time and system. Sorry. So you can see that even after many years of using Simio, I often have trouble with getting these expressions myself. Uh, but the expression builder can be very helpful in doing that. So sync one, time and system. And then here is where I want to specify a unit type because I know these are times and I want to report these in minutes. Again, we can just as easily report them in hours, but for whatever reason, I like to report those uh, in minutes. It makes more sense to me. So I'm going to run. Uh, again, same thing that we did with the utilizations. Let's just see that I'm in the realm of expectation here. Somewhere in the 30s. I think this one was 6 hours-ish times 60, whatever that is, 3,600 or something. So we're seeing something less, 25 here. And... My W is not showing up at all, so that tells me I have a problem with my um, with my expression. So let's go back and try this again. Sync one. Time and system. Oops, I need the average. I forgot that. I just had time and system. And now when we run, hopefully we're going to uh, see some values here. All right, so now we're seeing those values. So... So ordinarily, I would have edited out some of that uh, previous stuff where I couldn't find the expression and I had the expression wrong. I decided to leave them in this one because, again, I want to make it clear that determining Simio expressions is not always easy. It doesn't always happen off the top of your head. So learning how to construct those and learning how to, uh, to use the system to help you construct them uh, is an important skill to have. And so I decided uh, I would leave those in. Okay, so we have our now our... Um, our uh, performance metrics. And so the thing that we want to look at now is looking at the run length, the warm-up period. Let me go to my experimental properties here. So my experiment properties and the um, uh, number of replications. And so if you've had any, uh, if you had much simulation, you know that there's no magic bullet to determining these values, uh, number of replications, uh, warm-up period and run length. But you do know, hopefully, that the, the larger those numbers are, the closer your number, the closer your performance metrics are going to be to their true values. Uh, and so uh, it's better to err on the side of too many uh, than too little. I'm not going to spend a lot of time doing that. I'm just going to tell you that through my experimentation, and as I said before, this is something that you should try, uh, the values that I came up with is I'm going to do my run for uh, uh, 12, oops, 1,250 hours, and then I'm going to use a 250-hour warm-up. And I'm going to do 32 replications. And a quick note on why I chose 32. Again, I mentioned this before uh, in previous videos. Uh, when you run a Simio experiments, it shuffles 
uh, different replications out to different cores on your processor. And so it's m computationally efficient if you have this number to be some multiple of your cores. So I have eight cores, so I have um, uh, uh, 32 uh, is, is the multiple that I, I came up with. So now that I have these values, I'm going to reset uh, and run. And now this is the first run that I would then compare to the values that I saw in my queuing model. So we're going to let this run, and then I'll come back when it finishes running. So our experiment finished, and so here are our results. And uh, before I do my comparison, again, let me emphasize the fact that I didn't just make these numbers up, the 32, the 1250, and the 250. I did some background uh, experimentation uh, to come up with those numbers, and so you should be doing that too. So you can't always just uh, guess the numbers. Sometimes you guess right. As I said, if I made this number 40 or this number uh, say 2,000 or something, my results would be closer to, uh, closer to the actual values, but in a lot of cases that, 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 that level of precision just doesn't matter. So let's go back to our queuing model, see if I can shrink this guy down so I can see everything here. Uh, not letting me do, there we go, shrink that down, make it a lot smaller. And so as I said, the numbers that are exact are these, our Utilization, so we have 73.3, here we have 73.6, and if I want, I can go back and look at my response results, and here's my utilization. And so 73.6 is somewhere right here, so again, as we would expect, it's well within our confidence interval. If I want to be more confident, of course, I could just increase the number of replications or somehow increase the uh, run length. Uh, I'm not going to do that in this case, but I could certainly do that. For S2, 93.3, uh, uh, versus 93.9, close to 94. For S3, uh, 83.3, so it's 84. And S4 is 90, 90.2. So these are should be exact. And so if you get values that are not close to that, you should run more. In fact, in this case, you should convince yourself. So you should go back and say, well, instead of 32 replications, let's try 64. Uh, and just make sure that you can zero in on here. Uh, zero in on these actual numbers because determining correctness, in this case verifying the model, is critical to being able to use the model. The other values that we have, as I said, these will not be exact because we haven't met the, uh, all of the assumptions for our, uh, for our queuing network analysis, but they should be, you know, within the ballpark. And so we see the expected value here of 30.75. The actual value that we got is 33.6. And then for the timing system, now we've converted it to minutes. Uh, instead of 307, we're getting 335.1. So again, within the ballpark. And unfortunately, with these, you know, without a significant amount of queuing expertise, we don't really know how close we would expect these to be. And so for this case, we're just going to assume uh, that these values are close enough. And so with that, we're going to say, you know, we have implemented the model correctly, correctly in the sense that we have implemented our specification. You know, we wanted to have Poisson arrivals at the rate of six per hour. Uh, we wanted to have the processing at the specified rates and the routes and so on. And based on our uh, comparison with queuing, we developed our expectation and we're close enough to our expectation where I would say, you know, we should be satisfied with the verification of the model. So to summarize our experiment, we just created an experiment. We set our run length to 1250, our warm up for 250. Uh, I don't have the replications here, but we did 32. And then we set up our uh, experimental responses. Okay, so for the experimentation that we want to do, we have to ask ourselves a question of what's the maximum sustainable throughput that our system can have? So we have a given throughput or we have a given arrival rate. And so if the system is stable, the throughput and the arrival rate will be the same. Uh, we have a given of six per hour, but what if we want to know what's the maximum that we can sustain? And that's what our simple experimentation is going to do. So the first way that I would approach this is I would just, well, what can we learn from the queuing model? And so we can estimate the maximum value of the arrival rate where the system is stable. So let's go back to our queuing model. And the arrival rate that we have, our lambda value here, is specified, make this big so we can see it, uh, right here. So there's our, our, our rate. Um, so we have the rate and the inner arrival time. So we know if we reduce the inner arrival time, we increase the rate. And so what we want to do is we want to make sure that the system is still stable. So the maximum value of these, which I've got right here, so this is the maximum utilization, has to be strictly less than one to guarantee stability. So for example, if I go in here and say, well, what if we reduce the inner arrival times to nine? 
which gives us an arrival rate of 6.67. We have a problem here because station two uh, it has a utilization of greater than one, which means the system is unstable. So I could go back here and manipulate this by hand and say, well, what if we make this 9.1? And 9.1 is still a problem. So let's make it um, in arrival time 9.5. And now we have a stable system, so we've increased our utilization to 0.982 and so on. So I could go back in and, and do that manually. I could also use the solver function, which is what I did here, where I just used our solver. So I'm going to go to my Excel solver. Uh, I don't have the solver loaded, so let me pause the video and I'll be right back. All the problems of developing a module on one computer and then recording the videos on another. So you can see that I've loaded the solver now. And so if I open my solver, you can see that my uh, solver is to maximize my uh, 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 arrival rate, which is equivalent to my throughput in a stable system, uh, by changing this inner arrival time, subject to the single constraint that this maximum value or the maximum utilization is uh, less than or equal to something very close to one. So if I solve that, uh, you can see that I have, in fact, the maximum utilization very close to one. And so this tells me that, you know, really close to my maximum value would be uh, a 9.343 uh, in arrival time uh, for a rate of 6.42 hertz per hour. So we can go put that in. So if I went back to my model and said, well, let's check this out. If I do a 0.93, or I'm sorry, 9.343 for my inner arrival times, go back to my job shop model, and then make this one 9.343. Oops, nine. Oops, did I click the A? 9.343 uh, in minutes. And then I can go back to my experiment and I won't let this run to completion, but we would expect this utilization to be pretty close to one, uh, but still less than one, so we will still have a stable system. Let it run for our first set of. Uh, 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 first set of replications, and there we are. And so we'll just cancel that out. We don't need to see the results. Uh, we can see that it does have a high utilization uh, as we expect. So that is our first method of, of doing that, is just look at, uh, do some experimentation with our queuing model. Uh, the second way that we're going to look at doing it is we're going to use our baseline model to do just a little bit more experimentation. We've kind of already done this first part where we're experimenting with the estimated value. But what I want to do now is I want to talk about something like the practical maximum. So if you looked at the maximum sustainable throughput that we got, we had really high uh, whip and time and system values. So go back to my model. We didn't run uh, a huge number of replications, but we can see that the number and system here is, uh, you know, close to 160. And the time and system here is, you know, 14 uh, 80 minutes, so very high values. And so while that's not a problem theoretically, the system is still stable. In any real systems, these large values are generally not possible, or at least they're not practical. So if we think about the context of our manufacturing system, we would have a huge amount of physical space required uh, to have that many uh, parts in the system at any one time. So that's generally not practical. So what we want to do is we want to define something called a practical maximum. And one way to do that, the way that we're going to look at it for this really simple example, is we're just going to apply a constraint on L. So we're just going to say, I want the maximum throughput such that L, the average number in system, doesn't exceed a particular value. Now, we could just as easily have set a constraint on W or set constraints on the individual WJ or LJ value. So if we have station constraints, we can implement all of those. We're just going to demonstrate this one uh, simple constraint and then do a really simple a simio experiment to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, solve that optimization problem. So what we're going to do for our max throughput model is we're going to duplicate the baseline model. Then I'm going to use a reference property for the mean in arrival time. And once I do that, once I use the reference property, of course, then it becomes an experimental control. Uh, and then I could experiment with different values. It, it, make, it makes things simpler. And then also we will have a quick uh, implementation of, uh, of using OptQuest. So let's go back to our model. And as I said, let's reset my model here. Go back to model. And I said I want to duplicate this, or I want to replicate this. Let's see, I forgot to name this guy. So let me go ahead and name this one baseline. I forgot to do that earlier. And I can just right click, and that will then duplicate, or it gives me the option to duplicate. So there we go. There's our uh, duplicated model. We'll just rename this guy to be max throughput. 
And as I said, uh, for my max throughput model, I want to specify this mean inner arrival time using a reference property. So I'm going to go back to my definitions and properties, and I'm going to define a standard property. I'm going to define this as a real, and I'm going to call this IAT for my mean inner arrival time. And we can say the uh, default value, I don't know, let's make it 10. Uh, since that's what we started with. And so when I go back to my model, we can see I have my controls here and I have my inner arrival time of 10. And so then I just need to apply that for my source. And so now I'm going to just go change this guy and make this IAT. And so there we have uh, our inner arrival time specified by uh, this reference property. And then, of course, we want to uh, do some, a preliminary run. So I'm going to just do that run uh, in interactive mode. And then I would expect uh, in my results these values to be the same as we saw before because we at this point haven't really changed anything. So I'm satisfied of that. And now I can go back and look at my experiment. And now as promised, we have an inner arrival time for control. So I'm going to make that 10. Uh, and then we'll just run our uh, uh, experiment. And now we would expect this, this experiment to be the exact same values that we saw from the initial runs of our uh, baseline experiment because we haven't changed uh, any of those uh, any of those values. So we completed that run and these are extremely close to what we saw before. They shouldn't actually be exactly the same because remember we did change this runtime from 1000 to 1250 so that we could use the warm-up period in the experiment but in the interactive run we didn't incorporate the, the uh, warm-up period so we have a slightly different results but again within uh, our expectation. And now that I have this defined, I can go in and say, okay, well, let's check out that, that value that we just saw before, which was 9.43, was it? Let's see, what was that number? 9.343. Yeah, so 9.343. And we'll just leave it at 10. We don't need to run 32. We probably won't even run 10. Uh, we'll just run, and what we expect to see is this utilization to be really high and these two numbers to be really high. Hopefully that's not going to take that long to run. So there we go. So now there's our 99.5 and, and again, two really high numbers. And so remember again that our objective here is to maximize the throughput subject to a constraint here. Okay, and there are a couple ways to do that. I could just experiment and if I were doing this model myself, for real, not for this video module, I would do some more experimentation before I just jumped into OptQuest. Now I've already done that. Uh, but that's something you should do. Stop the video, go do some experimentation, just, you know, try to figure out what this value is, you know, on your own. That value in that and understanding how the, the process works. Uh, and people way too often immediately jump into uh, to using OpQuest. So in preparation for using OpQuest, I need to make one more change in that what we want to maximize is the throughput, but we don't have throughput as a response. So I need to add that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add my response called throughput. And throughput is just going to be the rate at which entities, go back to my model here, the rate at which entities go to the sink. So I have my input buffer number entered, and this is the running count. And then if I just take this value and divide it by the run length, then that's going to give me the rate that I'm after. It's a little bit more complicated than that in this case because we have this warm-up period, so I have to make sure that I don't count the warm-up period. So my throughput is going to be, see if I can use the expression builder and get this right the first time, sync1 input buffer number entered. And then I need to divide it by run uh, time now. Minus, and so one more thing I have to bring up here is that when I do run here and hit period, you know, it doesn't expand. Well, that's because I have filtered into commonly used expressions. So I need to turn that off. And as soon as I do, you can see when I turn that filtering off that it gives me a whole bunch of things. And what I'm after now is this warm-up period. So now if I just select that, what I have is I have time now minus the warm-up period. So that's going to be the actual run time over which this number was tracked. Okay, so we can just do a quick little run here to make sure that we're seeing that. And so there we go. We don't need to let it run to completion. We can just look at these two throughput values. And again, what we expect this one to be, since we have an inner arrival time of 10, we expect this one to be 6. 
And since this is uh, 9.343, we expect this one to be somewhere around that, that maximum value that we got uh, in the queuing model. Bring that guy back up. Uh, 6.422 right here. And, you know, we're within the realm of uh, expectation. So, again, I'm satisfied that this is actually tracking uh, what we want. So I'm going to reset my model, and then I'm going to go for my throughput and say that my objective here is to maximize, because we have to have an objective for OptQuest. And then I'm going to go back to my experiment, look at my experimental properties, and say that my primary response is throughput. And then I can incorporate the OptQuest add-in by just going to select add-in. I want to use OptQuest. This is my warning saying it's going to delete a bunch of stuff. That's fine. And then here are the basic uh, OptQuest uh, parameters. So I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time discussing these. I'm just going to go through the, uh, this one, and then we will talk about OptQuest a little bit later. So I'm going to first reduce this to, I only want to run about 50 replications. And what I want is I want to maximize this guy. So you can see that since I set my primary response here, uh, it uh, selected it as throughput. So I want to maximize throughput. And then I have a constraint on L. So my constraint on L says my upper bound of this is, let's say, 50. So I want to maximize the through throughput subject to the maximum average number of entities in the system is 50. So I set that constraint there. And then I have just a single control. And so this is my inner arrival time. And so we need to say, I want to include this in the optimization, and then we need to give it the minimum, the maximum, and the increment. And here's where a lot of preliminary experimentation can help. Because if I had done no experimentation, I would have no idea where the optimal value is. In my mind, I have a general idea of where it is, because I know with inter-arrival times less than about 9. Uh, 9.4 or so, the system is unstable. So I don't need to look at any values lower than that. And I know at 10 that I, uh, that I, uh, I, I still have room to go, right? So what I want to do is I'm going to set this minimum value to be 9.3 and my maximum value to, let's just make that 10 point, I don't know, 2. And then make this in steps of point, I don't know, point oh five. So this is saying I want to start at 9.3. I want to do steps of 0.05. I want a maximum value of 10.2. And my uh, property for my experiment says I only want to do 50 scenarios. So now that I have that defined when I run, so me, uh, OpQuest is going to take over and it's going to then run. Uh, and it decides how to set these values. So it does some preliminary setting of values to sort of frame the region uh, and then uh, tries to hone in on uh, the uh, the best value. So I'm going to pause the video here, and then I'll come back when OptQuest is finished. Okay, so we're back, and you can see that it's run to completion. One one quick note here, you can look at this. The run com the run took 314 seconds, and so using OptQuest uh, can, can take a little bit of computation time because we have a pretty simple model. It's pretty highly constrained, and I think this is one of the reasons that I mentioned earlier that people oftentimes jump into using OpQuest too quickly. The thing that made it, you know, reasonable here is that we had a pretty good idea of the range of values that we were after for inter-arrival time. We knew the general neighborhood of the value we were looking for. Had we not known that, if we had to experiment over a wider range or if we had more uh, controls, then it would the, the OpQuest run could have been quite a bit longer. So we can go back over to our throughput now and let's just sort our values. So let's see, how do I sort? I want to sort from smallest to biggest. I know there's a way to do it somehow. Sort. Sort descending. And so our value, our optimal value based on our experiment is the first one that doesn't have red here because these don't meet our constraint. And you can see it's this value that's checked. Uh, and so you can see that our inner arrival time is 9.7. Uh, and we have a maximum val a maximum or the average number in system is 43.78. So we still have room. We still have room for uh, more. And so the true value is most likely between these two values because we have 9.75 and this is just over the maximum, but this is way under the maximum. So if I were really doing this experiment, and again, you should be figuring out that when I say something like if I were really doing it, that means you should do it. Uh, is explore a little bit more around these two values. So you could read the rerun op quest by fine-tuning these values, 
or use the uh, select best scenario using KN, uh, add in, or something to explore around these two values to find uh, the true optimum. So that concludes uh, module two, uh, or video two, sorry. In video two, what we did was we went through a verification exercise, and then we did uh, some simple experimentation with our model. In the next video in this module, we will look at converting the random arrival process to an arrival table, which more closely aligns with our goal of uh, implementing a planning and scheduling type model.